Good afternoon. I am Alan Salamont, the Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. Welcome to today's conversation with author Ijoma Oluo, which will be moderated by Tufts Associate Provost, Dr. Joyce Sackey. This event is part of the Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series, which invites leaders from across academia, politics, media, and the arts, and all areas of public life to speak with the Tufts community and some of the most important issues facing our world. This semester, we've already hosted former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, and last week, former Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. You can view full video of those events on the Tisch College YouTube channel. On Thursday, we will hold a virtual civic life lunch with Rachel Kite, the Dean of the Fletcher School of International Law and Diplomacy. Rachel Kite, Dean Kite is an international expert on climate change. Next week, we will be hosting CNN commentator Van Jones and also PBS White House correspondent Yamish Alcindor. You can register for those events and talks and see our full lineup of speakers at tishcollege.tufts.edu slash events. We partner with schools and departments across the university on many of our events. And today we're pleased to partner with the Tufts University School of Medicine, as well as with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and Jumbo Vote. For many years, we have co-sponsored a common book program for incoming students at the Tufts School of Medicine. Today, uh, together, we selected a book that will inspire and challenge students as they begin their training to become civically active and socially responsible physicians. This book, the, this year, the book that was chosen was Ijoma Oluo's So You Want to Talk About Race. And in light of the importance and timeliness of the book's topic, we expanded the program and provided the book not just to first year medical students, but to every student and faculty member at the University's School of Medicine. For us at Tisch College and at the medical school, promoting conversation and action on racial justice is an indispensable part of preparing students to participate in civic life. We know that it's a work in progress. We know that we have lots to do at this institution and in our country. I am heartened by the fact that there are hundreds of people joining us right now. And I hope all of us are heartened by the fact that so many peers and community members wanna do this difficult work in community together. The impressive audience today is also a testament to our speaker and her important voice. Ijoma Oluo is a Seattle-based writer, activist, and in her words, internet yeller. She began writing about race in America on a personal blog, and her work has now appeared in The Guardian, The Washington Post, Time Magazine, and many other outlets. In 2018, she published So You Want to Talk About Race, which Harper's Bazaar described as a straightforward guidebook to the nuances of conversations surrounding race in America. The book would rise to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Ijoma was named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential Americans in 2017 and 2018 She's also been the recipient of the Feminist Humanist Award from the American Humanist Association, the Media Justice Award from the Gender Just Justice League, and the 2018 Aubrey Davis Visionary Leadership Award from the Equal Opportunity Institute. Joining Ijoma for today's conversation is Dr. Joyce Sackey, Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officer for the Tufts University Health Sciences School. Joyce is a member of the university's academic and provost councils, and she previously served on the Tufts President's Council on Diversity and Inclusion. Alongside Dr. Robert Mack, who is the Chief Diversity Officer for the Tufts Medford Somerville campus, Joyce co-chairs the university-wide 
Bridging Differences Initiative. Joyce is also the Dean for Multicultural Affairs and Global Health and an Associate Professor at the Tufts University School of Medicine, where she oversees a variety of initiatives focused on recruitment, retention, and development of underrepresented minority students and faculty. We're grateful to Dr. Joyce Sackey for moderating the conversation this evening, and of course, to Ijoma Uluo for joining us. We're especially grateful given that Ijoma suffered a personal tragedy last week when her house burned down. Ijoma, we're sorry for the terrible loss. You've been in our thoughts, but we are so glad that you and your family are safe and we couldn't be happier that you're able to join us today. So without further ado, let me turn the conversation over to Joyce Saki and Ijoma. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. And um, Ijoma, welcome once again to Tufts University. I am just thrilled and honored to be speaking with you this, this evening. There's so many people who have told me how wonderful your book was when they read it. And of course, I knew it was wonderful, but it's wonderful to know that this has been read beyond the medical school as well. So I'm sure that there are a lot of people who wish to ask questions. So I'm going to suggest that while I, I will start with some questions, I will suggest invite people to also use the um, Q&A version to sort of submit additional questions that uh, we might be able to get to. So first, this book is on the New York bestseller list. But I want us, I want you to take us back to how you decided to write a book on race. You mentioned in your preface to your book that you wrote this book in part out of frustration. So I would welcome that you can walk us, if you can walk us through the journey that led you to decide to write this book, that'd be very helpful. Absolutely. Um, you know, I really, I am, I've always been kind of a problem solver, right? And I, I try to make sure that my work um, helps solve a problem or gets people closer to solving a problem. And writing, you know, I've been an article writer for years. And what I had found was that I was being asked to explain the same problems over and over again. And people were not seeing the patterns around it. And I was beginning to doubt the effectiveness of being able to really write any article that would give people a fundamental understanding of how race works in the world to where I wouldn't be asked, can you explain this different flavor of racism versus this flavor of racism? when it really was all the same. And I firmly believe that it is rare to get a platform. It is rare to write things that people hear. And we have to take responsibility for what we put into the world. And I really believe in the utility of these discussions, especially because so much work and pain goes into issues around race and racism. And in the frustration of being asked, you know, can you explain why black people get arrested in Starbucks versus can you explain why black people get arrested at barbecues versus can you explain why black people are arrested while jogging through the park, you know, um, was realizing like maybe people need something to hold. <laughs> maybe people need something to take with them. But also when I started asking people what issues they were having around race, I was really expecting to hear from a lot of white people. Uh, because that's who was emailing me. And I would get emails all of the time from white people who I think watched too many like sitcoms because I would get like, this is on deep background or, you know, don't, don't publish this question, but I don't know what intersectionality is. And I was like, well, um, obviously a lot of people don't. And people were so afraid to admit that they didn't know what these terms meant. They didn't know how to move forward in these conversations but it still actually wasn't stopping them from trying, but they were trying without any information and it was going disastrously. So I started asking, you know, what problems are people having talking about race? And what surprised me, because I think I've been working and writing in this field for so long, was how many BIPOC people, uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color I heard from who were saying, you know, I know something's wrong, but when I try to explain it, I don't have the words. Um, or when I try to, someone dismisses me and it ends up going worse for me than if I hadn't said anything at all. Or I don't know how to say someone in a way that will be safe where I won't you know, have reprisals. And that's when I knew I could write the book. 
because I imagined something that would bridge the gap between academic racial theory that is so vital that my work and the work of so many others is based off of um, and what's happening in your workplaces, in your churches, in your you know homes, in your neighborhoods. I needed people to understand why this mattered. And it matters because how it affects people in their lives, how it impacts our ability to get through not only the day, but to survive. And so I decided to write the book and it was a, a long journey, but I am very glad for it. Oh, you're muted. We're very glad that you wrote the book. So it probably would be helpful to start with some definitions. Um, there are obviously lots of defini definitions out there for uh, race and racism. I was particularly intrigued by the working definitions that you had in your book. And so I wondered if you can just walk through uh, 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 with us how you came about the sort of, rule of rules of thumbs uh, for uh, thinking about what uh, if, if race is in operation. I thought it was intriguing. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, race, of course, kind of ends up being this fungible thing, right? It's um, this made up category based on characteristic skin color, hair texture, features that has real life functions, that has entire systems built around it. And so a lot of times people try to dismiss the idea of race because it was made up. But like I say in the book, money was also made up and we can't actually dismiss the idea of money because we won't be able to eat. Um, race functions very similarly. It impacts our lives. It's one of the most important indicators of health and welfare and well-being in this country. Um, and so we have race and we have ethnicity. And in understanding those, it's important to recognize that ethnicity is more tied to country of origin or ancestral country of origin. Um, it is somewhat fungible, but not in the same way race is. And you can have race within an ethnicity. So you can be Afro-Hispanic or not. And there is race within that and therefore layers of racism within that as well. But when it comes to racism, the big debate um, that people are talking about is, really whether racism is just any time you have bias, show bias towards someone based on the color of your skin or whether or not it's back, it's bias backed up by a system of power. I, and I would say the majority of race theorists and race scholars use the latter definition. It is racial bias backed up by a system of power. And we do this simply for effectiveness for utility. It is not because we feel like cutting a group out of the definition or, or silencing someone's grievances. It's because when we are looking at the problem of racism in this country, what we are looking at are the problems that are caused by bias influenced by systems of power or by systems of power outright. So when we are talking about fixing problems of racism, we are not necessarily talking about making sure your neighbors like you or making sure people think positive thoughts when you walk by. What we're talking about is making sure that if your neighbor doesn't like you, they can't call the police and have you shot. Making sure that if someone's hiring you and they think something negative about you, that they can't decide you're not qualified for that job. We're talking about how it impacts people. And so I, as someone trying to solve a problem, um, think it's vital that we look at the systems of power. And part of why it's vital is if we do not look at the systems of power, then we can't actually solve the problem. And you can ask, you can look at people who are married to BIPOC people and still actively promote systemic racism. There is no way that we can increase the net financial worth of black people in America by 13 times, which is what we would have to do in order to equal it to the net financial worth of white households in America, simply by hugging each other more or thinking great thoughts about each other. We have to look at the system and, and, and work there. And so for me, I'm looking at what is costing lives and what can we do? And that's where the focus is. And that's why I narrow it down. It doesn't mean that um, racial bigotry or bias against white people isn't bad, but when it looks at the impact it has to, for you to get a job, to own a home, to be financially successful, to get equal medical treatments, right? Those sorts of things, you need to look at the system and the systemic backup of anti-white sentiment simply isn't there in America. 
Thank you. And actually, that is a nice segue to my next question. Um, you wrote again in your book that anti-racism is an action, not a sentiment. Uh, and I wonder if you can just expound on this, this simple but profound statement. Absolutely. You know, this was something that for me, it's funny because it was such a second nature and I tweeted out for something along the lines and people were stunned. And I was like, oh, I guess, I guess it's not how we talk about anti-racism because so often we talk about, you know, do you have that racist bone in your body? Have you thought a bad thing about a person of color and not what are you doing? And I had, you know, a neighbor who called me in June. Um, you know, after the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, he's white and a really, really well-meaning man. And he sounded really despondent. And he said, Joma, am I always going to be racist? Is it just too ingrained in me that it will always be there? And I said to him, you know, that's not my concern. That's not what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is what you do. Because you can be racist every day of your life or you could never think of racist thought. And all that matters is what you do with it. And so you may never read all of the preconceived notions that you have, that you've absorbed from a lifetime of media and education and collective messaging that told you bad things about people like me. But every single day, you can do something to dismantle racism, to dismantle the system. And that's what matters because Someone sitting in their home alone thinking great thoughts about BIPOC people does nothing to I had my ability to survive and thrive in a country that's really set against me. And so it is, you know, anti-racism is an action. And I think there's something so positive in knowing that the hard work of recognizing maybe where you've participated in harm can be rewarded by deciding to do something different. And every time that you seek that out, every time that you look into the systems, take a hard look and say, what decisions am I making? What am I participating in? Where am I deciding to speak up or not? You have the chance to do something that can make a measurable felt impact in the lives of BIPOC people. But the moment you don't do it, you're not being anti-racist. And so it's, a, it's an action. It's not a, it's not a state you arrive in. You know, it's not a degree handed down to you. It is a constant work. Wonderful. So Ichoma, how would you respond to those who say, you know, um, we're tired of talking about race and racism. If race, anti-racism is an action, let's, let's go do it. Let's go do whatever it takes to dismantle the structural racism. Why is it so important that we first learn to talk about race in an effective manner? And then the second part of my question is, how can we as an institution work to minimize the risks that you've described in your book that is associated um, with uh, racism. One of the ones that I actually stick, uh, stick, stuck to me was you talked about how sometimes people will talk about race and convince themselves they're doing something. So they end up in this loop of wanting to debate about race. So tell us why it's so important that we should talk about it, but talk about it effectively if we are to um, dismantle, anti I mean, dismantle racism. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, because it's important to recognize that in this country, we have a collective gaslighting around issues of race and racism in this country. So what we really have is a national narrative that says that what is happening every day to BIPOC people isn't really happening. And so we have, you know, people walk through the day, and I used to do this, and sometimes I do, thinking, I must be so unlucky, or maybe something's wrong with me, or maybe nothing's happening at all, and I've gone crazy. And it's because as a society, we don't talk about it. We don't give voice for it. So first and foremost, BIPOC people deserve to be heard. They deserve to say what is happening. They deserve to be heard. They deserve to hear what other BIPOC people are going through and find out they're not alone. It is a, a tool of oppression to deny people the language to describe what is happening to them. So that first and foremost is vital. Um, second of all, it's vital that we are sharing the information as we learn it. Uh, one person educating themselves about the racism in their space who doesn't then share to other people with other people who do not know isn't really doing anything or, or is, is minimizing their effectiveness in solving an issue. So we have to talk about it. Third, the decisions that we make, the actions we make need to be informed 
by the BIPOC people, and, and I don't know if I explained, but when I say BIPOC, I mean Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, by BIPOC people who are being impacted by the issue. So we could all go read our books, and uh, trust me, I have met kind of gung-ho white people who were saying, you know what, I read my Angela Davis, and this is what I decided to do. And they implement entire programs to try to fix problems of racism. And when I asked them, so what did the BIPOC people in the space think about it? They give me a blank stare because they never thought to ask. They never thought to ask, is this actually what you're experiencing? Will this help you? Um, and so that's important. It's also really important to know that it doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to people and saying, share with me, give me your experiences. In fact, that can be really draining and exploitative. It's important to, to recognize that people have been talking about what's happening everywhere for a very long time. And so you can actually reference what medical students, what doctors, what patients have been saying about race and racism for years. You can reference what's already being said and help inform kind of your idea as to what needs to happen. But these conversations are painful. These conversations are very painful for BIPOC people, even when they can be therapeutic. You're still digging into wounds, not just past wounds, but wounds of things that are still happening, wounds that are still festering, and in the hopes that it will make a difference. So we must be first and foremost careful about how we form these conversations, make sure that we are showing respect and care for the safety and the humanity of BIPOC people who are choosing to bestow the generosity of this conversation upon us, but also that we honor it with action and that we know why we're having these conversations. And enlightenment is not action. And I, I, I've said before, there's kind of this idea that anti-racism, especially in 2020, is this eat, pray, love journey for liberal white people, where they're going to hear the hard truths, you know, learn something and come out, you know, new and refreshed and wise and good. And it's not about you. It is about what you're going to do to undo the harm that has been done and is being done by the systems. So honoring the sacrifice of BIPOC people in these conversations, current and past and future, with action, action that is informed by the stated needs of BIPOC people is vital. Otherwise, all you're really doing is taking a field trip in someone's trauma. Thank you, so good. You also discussed the fact that microaggressions and everyday racism actually have health consequences. And as a physician, I was particularly intrigued by that chapter, that in fact, there is plenty of data to show that everyday racism leads to real harm psychologically and physically. Can you speak a little bit to that, the sort of impact of, of, of leaving microaggressions unchecked on the impact um, that it will have on BIPOC people, and especially um, some of the data that you've shared, I know elsewhere about um, disparities and, and disparate sort of impact on, uh, of diseases such as COVID-19 and others on, um, on um, people of color and how that may take its roots from, from sort of racism and everyday stresses of, um, of uh, microaggressions. Absolutely, I think it's important to recognize that you know, we are learning more and more every day about the impacts of long-term trauma. And a lot of times we know this, right, when we are working with veterans, right, or working with people who've, who've come from war-torn countries, we recognize that there are medical, mental health, and physical health impacts of what they face and the trauma they face. Oftentimes people don't understand that being a BIPOC person, especially in America, can have very similar effects, except you are still in that war zone. You are still in that battle every day. And so what we are seeing are increases of heart attacks, increases of dying from heart attacks, increases of dying from plenty of things, whether it's cancer, childbirth. And when, you know, when doctors look at childbirth and saying, why are so many black people dying in childbirth? And they, you know, they control for things like income and they control for things like access to medicine, they are still left with what seems to be nothing more than the absolute stress of trying to grow life and the strain that puts on your body in a society that seeks to harm you. When you can never relax, when you can never feel safe, your body, all the biological responses of fight or flight are going on constantly. I've personally actually lived this, in fact, too. This isn't in the book because it's happened since, but 
some people are aware if they if they follow me online that our family was personally targeted by white supremacists last year. And so in our, we had to leave our home. It was a very traumatic experience um, that made us feel really inherently unsafe. Mm-hmm. And once we moved, the threats stopped from that incident. But I still every day would get up, engage in the world, read the news, see what's happening to black people in America, feel unsafe. And after a while, I kept wondering if I was getting sick. I just felt sick and all sorts of things, whether it was like my menstrual cycle, I would get, I would get, a, I would get a, I would get what felt like the flu for a week, two weeks, and it would go away. Nothing was working right. I thought I was going into menopause. And I went to my doctor and ran so many tests and she just said, you know, Ijoma, here's the thing you experience trauma and normally people experience trauma, they get to a safe place, they can heal. But every day you are still a black woman in this world and you don't actually get to heal from that trauma. What you have right now is PTSD and this is what it looks like. And she was like, trust me, all of these tests, none of them are gonna come out positive. Everything is going to say it's fine because right now what you're experiencing are the physical impacts of prolonged trauma that you can't escape. And even knowing that helped a little bit, but still it's something where, you know, I know so many people who experience that, black children who experience this day in and day out. And psychiatrists have shown that, you know, black youth, especially in what we call inner cities are showing classic symptoms of PTSD, you know, even by middle school and high school. Um, So we must recognize that these everyday issues that people might think are no big deal are no big deal if they happen to you maybe once a month or once a year. But when every day they serve as reminders that you aren't safe where you are, that you don't belong where you are, that it could get worse at any moment, the impacts are extreme. And it's not just one person either, this is intergenerational. So the impacts of children whose parents are, are facing this day in and day out matter as well, of children who are experiencing this in the womb matter as well. Um, it is a serious crisis and every day there's new evidence and especially in the COVID era, era where we're seeing people just dropping people who should be surviving. And even right now, you know, the latest news stories that are saying that um, black and Hispanic children are dying at more than twice the rate of COVID. And they shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be an impact, but that's what happens. So it's just really vital that we look at this as not only a crisis of conscience, but a public health crisis as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I wanna shift gears and talk about intersectionality. You, You discussed in your book uh, the importance of intersectionality. Um, but for me, I also felt like you really modeled this very well. And I'm deeply appreciative of all these specific examples that you cited to really bring home the importance of intersectionality. Why is it important that we keep intersectionality in mind as we work towards dismantling systemic racism? It's really vital simply because there aren't parts of us we leave at a door, right? So I am a black queer woman. And when I enter a discussion about race, I don't leave woman or queer at the door, right? If I'm entering queer friendly spaces, I don't leave woman or black at the door. It is all of me. But also these things inform these issues. When we talk about how race impacts me as a black woman, me being a woman also adds to the experience of my general unsafety, the exploitation I face, you know, the sexualization I face in society. And being queer adds that other level of, you know, queer phobia, both in black circles and out that undermines my sense of safety in trying to create anti-racist spaces and feel safe as a black person in this country. So it is important to understand this because if we don't and we're trying to do let's say anti-racist work, we are therefore only making the most privileged people safe. We're only doing effort that improves things for the most privileged people. And we have done this time and time again. Um, There is an instinct towards the people who've always been heard being centered. And this means even in marginalized groups, um, when we talk 
about, you know, anti-racism, straight, cis, abled Black men are the first priorities. And even when we look at who we march for day in and day out, um, these are the priorities that we have. And what that means then is when we're looking at solutions, when we're looking at resources, we are leaving out huge groups of people. So intersectionality is basically the idea coined by, of course, the amazing Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, that we will do harm if we don't look at how intersecting oppressions work together. And it really is important to stress that Dr. Crenshaw wanted this to be functional. She was not talking just about sentiment. She was looking at social programs, medical programs, economic programs that were aiming to help women and how they were actually harming or, or failing to help Black and Hispanic women first, and then also queer women. And now we talk about disabled women, trans women as well. And so looking at that, it's about making sure your solutions work. And you don't turn around one day and say, oh, well, I thought I was helping BIPOC people, but it turns out I was only helping this narrow subsection of BIPOC people, and I've actually cemented in further harm for people who are already more vulnerable in the first place because I didn't ask. So it's really a reminder to look around the room and say, who's not here? Who am I not considering? Who needs to be here? Who needs to be maybe decentered a little bit so we can center people who are most at risk in this discussion? Yeah. Thank you. And um, the other question, um, I think um, it, you shared in, in the book how you engaged in a very brave but important conversation with your mother, who is white, and how she ended up actually becoming an incredible ally. And so speaking to, I bet that the bulk of the audience here is white. So I wonder if you can speak to how we, all of us can engage in this work and especially for those who write every day and say, I want to be an ally, how can I help? What would be the advice for how we can see this work as something that all of us have to have all hands in deck to do? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to recognize that kind of the trap that my mother had fallen into that was impacting our relationship is one that many white people fall into when it comes to issues around race, which is she assumed that acknowledging our racial differences would put a wall between us. She assumed that acknowledging that she was white and I was black would, would put this divide between us that we couldn't overcome. And so she avoided talking about it. And what that did was it actually built a divide because it sent signals to me repeatedly that my whole self was not welcome. And this grew as my work grew. My mom was never one of those luckily white mothers of black children who tried to pretend like their children weren't black. But where she felt like she couldn't fit into my work. She felt like my work was, you know, diving into territory she was uncomfortable with because she hasn't been racially profiled. You know, she hasn't been made to feel unsafe when a police car come, pulls up next to her. That she decided to avoid it altogether. And it really started to make me feel like there was this whole part of our conversation, this whole part of my life that we could never delve into. And whenever things would come up, it, there would be this silencing that really made me feel unseen. I want people to understand how common that is. And oftentimes I hear from people saying, things would be better if we just never talked about race. You know, the reason why this divide exists is because we keep talking about it. And the divide exists actually because you refuse to talk about it, because you refuse to see one of the most defining factors in someone's life. And so when we recognize that, and when my mom got over that fear, and there were definite tears shed because she's my mother and she was really afraid. When we explained this and when she finally came to terms with the fact that she was never going to, you know, know my full experiences, then, and that she had different experiences and different responsibilities and had them, then she was able to be open to the thought she could do something different to the thought that she could engage whiteness. And what it did fundamentally to change our relationship was it gave, her, it empowered her. It helped her see that she was actually a part of a system that was harming me and therefore could make a difference. So instead of thinking she was just like me and hurting right along with me, and we were both victims of this horrible system, she could see where she had power in the system and she could do something. And the reason why my mom is a great ally now isn't because she's perfect. We are regularly having conversations where I'm just like, I can't believe you just said this, mom. This is so embarrassing. Like, thank God the internet can't see you because, oh, that would be awful. But 
she knows that she's white and there, and she knows that she doesn't know everything. She knows she's still learning, but she also knows that if she speaks up in a work meeting, that she'll be more likely to be hurt. She knows that she can have these conversations with her peers and it will mean something in a way in which other black people speaking up won't. She knows that she can leverage her privilege in a situation to try to change the systems around her. And that has made such a difference. It has helped me so much. And we are closer than we've ever been, but also she's closer to her coworkers of color than she's ever been, right? She is actively engaging in these topics, you know, especially since, you know, May and June with these horrific murders. If there's one thing she wasn't was afraid of conversation at this point, she was fired up, she was ready to go. She was angry and activated and really pushing ahead in her workplace to really get to making real change in a way in which in the past she would have said, she would have been really afraid. So I hope people look at the example of my mom and the continuing example, you know, she's a 69 year old white lady. And oftentimes people think they hit that age, it's too late to learn something new. And each day she's learning something new and she feels like she can actually make the world better for the black people she loves, you know, and she is. And that's, that's beautiful and wonderful. Yeah, that's really wonderful. That, and that's really fantastic. So um, I can keep going um, because I just love listening to you, but I know that there are mounting numbers of questions that are building up. So we're gonna transition now to our Q and A and I'm gonna turn things over to Jess uh, to, to begin to um, maybe take some of those questions for Ujuma. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Emma Livne. I'm a fourth year medical student at Tufts. Um, thank you so much for being here and entertaining our questions. Um, so my question is, your book provides the language and context to confront racism in ourselves as well as in dialogue with others. When working with a broad audience, how do you navigate bringing in those that may be otherwise disinclined or apprehensive into a conversation about race while also staying not only authentic, but unapologetic to your mission? There's a couple of things. One, I would say it's really important to state what your mission is. So state that and get buy-in. There have to be agreements as to what you're discussing and what you're not because there are often people who come into a space and it's not just that they're reluctant, but they've come determined to make sure that you don't talk about the things you set out to talk about. There are some people who won't understand, some people who think that everything is up for grabs in this conversation and it's not. So it's really important to be clear about the boundaries of the conversation. It's important to stick to that and to welcome people into that conversation. So to you know, to remind, this is actually what we're talking about. And you are welcome to join this conversation, but it's the conversation we're having. And then it's also just really important to notice the difference between people who want to engage in conversation and people who want to make to who to derail conversation and to know that the edification of one stubborn white person is not worth the progress that you plan to make in this conversation and not worth the safety and humanity of BIPOC people in that space. And so where you feel like you are moving forward, move forward. But where you feel like someone's trying to hold you back, you have to cut them loose or try to mitigate that situation because it sends a message. If you spend half of your discussion trying to get one stubborn white person to understand why you need to have that discussion. The message to the room is, is that that one white person is more important than everyone else in the room. And that in itself is not an anti-racist conversation, right? That is not something that disrupts white supremacy. But in stating the values and getting people to agree and saying, hey, you know, this is what we want to accomplish. Do you agree this is the conversation? You have something you can use to pull people back in. It's also really important before you have the conversation to know who's in the room. And if you know that someone's likely to lose their temper, likely to get upset, figure out what you're going to do, pause, when you're gonna recognize that they're getting to that space and put a breather in or ask if they need to step away for a minute or have someone pull them aside and explain. And I find that oftentimes in group conversation, that's really important. If you have a white person, especially, who can say, hey, Tim, I can explain this to you in a minute if you want to go outside and you want me to explain it to you later and then get back to the topic is really vital but it's important to just send that overall message that 
the mission matters more and the humanity of BIPOC people matters more. And we're gonna keep moving this conversation forward and people will catch up or they won't. But I think it's always vital that we remember the average black preschooler is four times more likely to be suspended from preschool than the average white preschooler. And when that happens to a four-year-old, no one pauses and says, wait, they're, they're not quite ready to experience racism yet. Um, let's slow it down. Let's make a gentler racism for them to ease their way in. They are thrown into it and we learn and we deal with that pain. And in the midst of it all, we've created vocabulary about what it is. We've written books about it. We've had meetings about it while raising our families while working our jobs. If you manage to get to full adulthood without understanding how systemic racism works, you don't get handheld through the process. You have to catch up and you have the ability to. And you really just have to keep moving forward and recognize that like any other kind of major important issue where lives are at stake, we don't, we don't wait until everyone understands that it's an important issue before we move forward. We say the lives matter and we're going to do the work. Thank you so much. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Urvashi. I'm a second year at the medical school. Um, my question is about the model minority myth. Um, so you talked about model minority myth in your book and about how it's been used to drive a wedge between different types of people of color. Um, so what advice do you have for non-Black people of color in engaging in anti-racism work, um, in ensuring that our voices contribute while also acknowledging the fact that we are affected differently by white supremacist culture? There's a couple of things. One I would say is first, understand how white supremacist culture works around you. So a lot of times where these divides happen is when people of color don't understand how white supremacy is actually impacting them. So a lot of times in the root, like what makes the model minority myth so strong is that there are a large percentage of Asian people in America who don't think they're subjected to racism because there's so much silence. That's the purpose of the myth, right? Part of it is to, to deny the reality and to gaslight black people and Hispanic people. But the other part is to make sure that when Asian people say something's wrong here, that they're told, no, see these stats, you're doing great, everything's fine. And it is important first and foremost to understand how white supremacy is impacting you and how it is functioning you know, as a system around you. You have to recognize that because you won't be able to find like commonality, you won't be able to see the system if you think it's consistently only an external problem, only something that impacts black people. You will find yourself in competition with other groups of color if you can't see the system. So, so recognize the system. And then it's also really important to look at where you have personal power and look at how white supremacy seeks to divide. So white supremacy seeks to divide by first making you ignorant of how it functions in your life. And second, by tying you to your space on this hierarchy of race and saying, um, you know, if you will always be better than these people if you can separate yourself from them. Whatever you can do to not be like black people, to not be like Hispanic people, um, then you will rise above. And recognizing that, that what it's actually doing is tying you to this little bit more you know, it's tying you to that space that will never actually be true equity or equality. Um, and recognizing that and trying to dismantle that is really vital. And it's vital not only to make sure that you aren't part of the oppression of BIPOC people, um, but also to make sure that you aren't part of your own oppression as well. And, and to try to dismantle that. I always tell people, uh, BIPOC people, that our goal primarily is to look at where we have power um, and where that power is caught enabling us to do harm. It is actually not our goal, and it is not our job to dismantle what white people are doing to stop them. We don't have that power. If we did, the system wouldn't exist. It is our goal to look at where we do have power and to talk about that and to work 
and say, okay, I have this power to participate in anti-Blackness and I need to stop. And I, I have the power to legitimize anti-Blackness and this is what I need to do to stop. Um, but a lot of that means that you have to open up to the painful reality that you are a person of color in this country and that means something and it means something really painful and it meant something painful to your parents. And oftentimes I find intergenerationally is where there are issues because the message that your parents gave you know, and had was your race didn't matter here or you just had to try harder and everything would be okay. And there is still a huge collective intergenerational pain that's never been addressed. And so you have to be able to say, oh, I am and I have been harmed. And it doesn't take away from your accomplishments. It doesn't mean that you can't do well. Um, but owning that and recognizing that is an important step in building empathy and solidarity with what BIPOC, what Black, especially Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic people are facing in this country. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Jenna Logue and I work at Tisch College. Uh, my question centers around education and parenting. Um, I, one of the things that I, I know that I can do as a white parent of a white child is to give her some language and awareness and ability to hopefully someday dismantle the system. Uh, recently, we were reading a book together and it was an older, like a chapter book, a little bit older than her age. Um, and in the book, the phrase, the N word was used in passing. And she asked me what the word was. And I didn't tell her what the word was because I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to say it. And I have never said the word out loud and I just didn't want her to have that vocabulary. After the, I told her that it was a hateful word, um, that was used against black people by white people. I did tell her that, um, but that I wasn't comfortable saying the word. So after the fact, I started to wonder if perhaps that was the wrong way to handle it because young black children and children of color have no choice but to have that word um, in their lives. So I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions or have um, come across anything like this where um, you might be able to offer your thoughts and input on that. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of things. One, I would say if it's just you and your child, they actually need to know what the word sounds like so they can recognize it when it's said. Um, and they need to know they absolutely cannot say it. And they need to know that you won't say it again, that you need, they need to know what it looks like. They also need to know what the impact of that word has today. So it's not just like a hateful word used, but using age appropriate descriptions of what happens when something like that is said to someone's peers, you know, so if a kid, your, if the kid, your daughter's age was called the N word, it would make them feel scared and unsafe because that word was used by people and is used by people who physically seek to harm black people. And it makes you feel like someone might hurt you. It makes you feel really hurt. It makes you feel like someone hates you. And, and using kind of age specific descriptors is vital. And then it's, it's vital to ask, so what do you think you should do when you hear this word said, right? It's, in, it's important to not just build a story of despair, but to build an idea and expectation of action. And so brainstorm, and you know, this is something I did with my son after, after the last election, my younger son was very heartbroken and feeling very disempowered and scared. And so we started talking about things like Islamophobia, trans misogyny, things impacting groups that he was outside of, you know, at the time. And we talked about what it must feel like, you know, to worry about whether your parents are going to be deported, what it must feel like to hear someone call you a terrorist because you're wearing a headscarf. And we said, okay, so what are you going to do to help make your classmates feel safe? What are you going to do when you hear someone say that? What are you gonna do when one of your, one of your friends in class repeat something they heard their parents say, and it makes, one of your classmates feel unsafe. And it did, it, what it did was it made him feel empowered. It made him feel like maybe it wasn't just a scary world of grownups trying to hurt each other, but that he could do something and could make a space where these horrible realities weren't the reality of that space. And that gave him hope in a, in a time when he didn't think he had it. And I think a lot of times we are very afraid that we will upset or you know discourage 
white children by talking about the reality because we forget the action part. We forget the, so what are we going to do? We forget to tell them that they can influence their peers, that their classroom is also a system and a society that they can influence and shape. And it's also just important because I like to say this, when we have children who want to be engineers and that's their great dream, we don't tell them that they can become engineers and never sign them up for a math class. We somehow though hope that our children will be anti-racist without ever having them practice the skills of anti-racism. And one of the most important skills they can have is to influence the environment around them, to influence their peers and to really set collective standards. And they can start doing that in preschool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm Winston, a second year med student over at Tufts. Um, and my question is, how do you recommend us as medical students and future doctors not lose our humanity in a field that teaches us to actively compartmentalize um, when we see trauma? Because um, just like trauma in the hospital setting, um, driving down the street and worrying when you drive past a police car or a child being suspended out of pre-K or seeing videos on social media of somebody being hunted down and shot is still forms of trauma. Um, and then going off that, how do we then work to really create a more caring culture? I think it's important that we recognize the, the real harm on this insistence of compartmentalization, of decompartmentalization is in the medical field. And we saw this, especially in the COVID pandemic, right? We saw the extreme toll. It was taking doctors day in and day out to try to act like this wasn't impacting their mental health, to act like they weren't seeing what they were seeing. And especially I would say, if you are a provider of color, to see your own community so devastated. Um, and it also stops people from treating effectively, from recognizing the holistic impacts of these systems on people. You have to be a whole person in a space. Further, I would say the idea to remain impartial is steeped in sexism, ableism, transmisogyny, and racism. Right? You can only remain impartial where you don't see it impacting you, where you don't see it impacting your family, your sense of community. And that is why often white men end up being the models for impartiality because they have already built those walls and saying, this would never happen to me. This gunshot victim would never be me, right? This person would never be me. I don't have to worry about it. And somehow we call that professional, but what it really is is privilege in action that actually stops you from being able to build bonds or see the full impact of an issue that's happening. So we really have to break away from that. We have to recognize um, the extreme mental toll that it takes and should honestly take to see the real impacts of the inequities in our society to be treating one of the main ways it shows up. It should impact you. Uh, because you should be invested in your community. Now, of course, we have to provide tools for people to safely be able to process that, to be able to take care of mental health. And that means we have to destigmatize trauma and we have to destigmatize mental health issues and state that it is actually a healthy response because it is a healthy response to building empathetic relationships and to being a human being who connects with other people to have this. When you have processes in place, and I say this as someone who day in and day out is neck deep in trauma. When you have processes in place, when you have connections in place, you can handle it so much better than if the expectation is that you turn off and you don't become a feeling person in this and you just keep working through it. It, it will stay in you. you. You don't stop being a person. It's also really, really important that we recognize if you are a BIPOC person, if you are specifically a Black practitioner, and you fundamentally believe Black lives matter, that you recognize that you are a Black life, and that you recognize that your ability to be whole and to thrive professionally and personally is something that you have to fight for as much as you fight for your patients and that you can't actually do anything to impact the systemic racism in your space if you're constantly sending out the message that your own personal black life doesn't matter. And that means that whatever you need to do to build connections, to build community um, is vital. I will also say this, 
it is an inherently white westernized thought that we get through hard times on our own and that I really believe this as a black woman, as a Nigerian American, that it is in my blood, it is in my nature to collectively get through trauma. It is how I have gotten through everything in my life. It is how my ancestors have gotten through. And where medicine loves to pull BIPOC communities away from traditional practices, away from what they know is true, this is one where we cannot let it slide and recognize that you have built into you, into your history, into your, into, your, into your blood, the need to hold yourself up with other people and to collectively process issues and to have community and to have support and recognize that your patients likely do as well. And that means that they need to actually feel you connecting with them and they need to know that you aren't leaving them on their own to process what's happening to them in their lives. And so that's something I have had to lean into um, and recognize the ways in which oftentimes Western medicine, and I am a firm believer in science. Like I have, I've, you know, I've never been to like a naturopath in my life, but I also recognize the ways in which that Western medicine tries to pull me away from what I know is true about what I need to get through trauma and what I need to stay healthy and what has gotten Black people in America through for over 400 years. And it has always been our ability to lean on each other, to heal collectively, to talk about what we're experiencing and move forward. Um, so push against that wherever you can and know that where you can, it will make you a better provider um, and it will increase your longevity. You will never stop being a Black person in that space. You will never get a promotion that will allow you to be an open black person in any space. So you have to take that space now. You have to decide now, what do I wanna do this 40 years from now? Do I still wanna be coming in here and trying to cut half of who I am out of my experiences? Am I gonna try to be in here and never connect to another human being in this space because I'm deciding to be impartial in this space? And you can't do that. And then finally, I will say this. It is also really important to recognize how spaces are built for whiteness and recognize that while it may seem like you've, like people, everyone is decompartmentalizing, they're not because what they have is actually adjustments that are made systemically to serve whiteness, to serve white trauma, white needs, white comforts. And that whole building, the structure you're in, the relationships you have at work are built around what makes white people, especially white men, more productive, better at their jobs. So you can say you're decompartmentalizing in a space that's built to serve you. But if it's not built to serve you, you have to be able to see yourself as a whole person in that space and talk about what you need in the space. Thank you so much. Thanks. Oh, yeah. to later. I'll say later. That's what I did last time. They might take you out. Oh, that's fine. I did ask. I did say. Well. I think uh, we're gonna wrap things up um, now. It's uh, 6.31 uh, and um, we wanna thank you so much, Juma, for joining us and really enlightening us today. Um, thank you for a book that is transformative, not only at the individual level, but at the institutional level. And we are confident that as a result of choosing your book as a common book reading for this year, that Tufts University as an institution will be well on its way to taking steps to become an anti-racist uh, university. So thank you very much for joining us. And thanks all for joining us. Bye-bye.